you all in person um, at our in-person meetup. I'm just gonna get right into it as folks roll in um, and we'll get moving with the event. Um, we are 30 minutes uh, off from our typical start time because I, I put the wrong time on meetup. So I apologize if it's a little late, um, but that uh, should be a great event nevertheless. Um, and this is New York Augmented Reality. Um, and it's great to see you all, great to see familiar faces. Uh, we have Ed Morris with us, uh, Ethan Sadia from PhotoCatch, Anshul Sag, and Josh Elster, uh, author of a new book, Going the Distance with Babylon JS. So all really cool. Um, now, our meetup's growing. Um, this is our 26th event, and we've hosted over 100 speakers from across the industry. So we're really excited to be a leading uh, augmented reality meetup. We meet every month. Uh, next month, we're we're meeting in person. It will be streamed as well uh, if you cannot make it. On July 25th, in partnership with Society for Information Display, um, we'll have food, drinks, speakers, um, and we'd love to meet you in person. So uh, you could RSVP on meetup.com. I think it will be great. And if you have anything you want to share or exhibit or present, just reach out to me and we'll, I'm, I'm happy to help uh, arrange that. So. Uh, yeah, it should be great. Um, now, before we move on to the presentations, I want to highlight some of the latest news and things going on in the industry. Um, today's the last day if you're a developer to uh, register for the NREAL AR Jam. So you can uh, develop uh, on NREAL's SDK for the chance to win uh, cash prizes. So it's the last day to register if you want to do that. Um, you can Google NREAL, NREAL AR Jam. As, and I'll also send some links out afterwards. So that's that. Um, Sony released an SDK time of flight AR for Unity um, for depth information uh, tracking in real time. So you could do uh, hand tracking, depth map, mapping, and segmentation through this SDK. So um, you could check that out as well if you're a developer. You might find it in handy. Hi, Beatrice. Welcome. Uh, Lowe's for designers, developers out there um, released 500 products um, of their own as 3D models on their website. So you can download them and explore them, open them up on uh, uh, your, your 3D app of choice. Um, um, like I guess Reality Composer is something simple you could open up on and play around with. Um, so yeah, that's Lowe's Open Builder. You could check that out as well. It's it's pretty cool. Um, I don't even think you need to sign up to download. Um, yeah, it's great. Um, some investments. Raythink does uh, um, AR heads up displays for automotive. They raised a fifteen million dollar uh, Series A round. Huston University in Bangor, Maine, received a two point two million dollar grant to train more students in extended reality, which is always good. Um, and a company called Proximi is uh, Proximi an AR, an AR surgical guidance platform raised $80 million series C. Um, and SoftBank was one of the new investors. So that's exciting to see that they're investing in AR. Um, and app of the month slash week, Niantic's uh, AR Voyage, you could test out Lightship see how the VPS works. It's not available on any, it is available, but if you really wanna see all the different features um, of Lightship, check out this app and you could really explore, play around and develop for yourself in the future. Um, so yeah, those are some of the latest news. And then earlier this month was AWE. So I thought there was no one better to share the news on AWE than Anshul Sag the principal analyst at More Insights, where he covers, this is a, uh, a, little, uh, a little bit of background, um, a multitude of areas as an industry analyst, including semiconductors, PCs, smartphones, wireless communications, 5G, and mixed reality. His insights can be found all over the web across many of the world's leading newspapers and technology publications. Uh, many of the firm's clients can be counted among the Fortune 500. Um, the perfect man, Anshul Sak, to uh, share with us an AWE recap. Thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me.
Awesome. Um, I guess I'll just kind of kick it off. Uh, I'm not going to do like a traditional presentation. Uh, instead, what I decided is I'm going to use some photos that I took from the event itself uh, and kind of run them as a slideshow through Google Photos uh, and kind of talk over it um, to let people know kind of what I thought about the show. Um, this was the first time that AWE was full blown as a show. Um, previously, they had a less capacity event in November. Um, this one really felt like a true full capacity event. And, um, you know, it was it was a it was nice to kind of be back and see a lot of people I haven't seen for a couple of years. So um, let me get started with sharing my screen. I will share that. All right. So um, I'm gonna just kind of start out with this is uh this is Ori Inbar, who's kind of the the head of AWE, and um, he's been kind of the spiritual leader of the show. Uh, and he does kind of like a very um, interesting kickoff at the beginning of the show every year. And that include him doing some air guitar. Um, but the big announcements of the show um, came from CEO of Unity. Um, I, unfortunately, Unity didn't really make any significant announcements of the show. They kind of just put their stake in the ground about what they how they define the metaverse. Um, and that was um, kind of a, sorry about that. It was kind of like a, um, you know, a, a, an attempt to guide what what the company believes as AR um, is and what the metaverse is specifically. And what's really interesting is, um, or not really interesting, is that they thought, you know, the metaverse has to be real time, which makes sense since Unity is a real time engine. Um, following them was Qualcomm, and they talked about how they have a, um, they have their Snapdragon Spaces uh, AR platform and that they now have a 23 company cohort, which is the first cohort of their Snapdragon Spaces Pathfinder program. Uh, that was um, originally launched last year, but, or even earlier this year, or late last year. And this is like the first cohort that they've actually brought on companies. Um, and they also invest, announced two investments in their $100 million metaverse fund, which included Echo 3D and Trip. Um, in addition to that, TRIP also raised funding at AWE uh, to the tune of $11 million in addition to previous funds that they've gotten before. Um, one of their big partners is actually Lenovo. Um, and they, um, Lenovo didn't really make any significant announcements, but what's important about that is Lenovo's headset, the Think Reality A3, which is AR glasses, is actually kind of the reference device for Qualcomm Snapdragon Spaces. So Lenovo actually had a lot of traction at the show in terms of being able to show a lot of people using their headset for different applications. And a lot of developers, including all of these um, Pathfinder partners are getting these glasses to, to build on Snapdragon Spaces. Um, and then on top of that, we, we had um, some, some interesting you know, exhibits. Uh, Magic Leap was at the show. Um, this is me finally getting my chance to try Magic Leap 2 after uh, six months of, of failing to do so. Um, and I, I have to say that um, I think Magic Leap 2 is a considerably better headset in every imaginable way. Um, and they've also taken a lot of really good approaches to software and open ecosystems, trying to make uh, the platform more attractive to as many developers as possible, as opposed to being secretive and trying to prevent people from getting access to the hardware and the software. I think they still have a, quite an uphill battle, um, but in general, I think that they've made a lot of improvements in field of view um, and their, their special feature with segmented dimming is very interesting. Although right now it doesn't feel very segmented, it mostly feels fairly uniform um, in the way that it's applied. Um, and they, you know, they kind of did a presentation with Kronos about OpenXR and how they're gonna be um, OpenXR compliant probably first quarter of this year, next year but they're, they're already releasing their OpenXR kit um, by the end of this year, sometime in the fall. And then um, what else would, oh, and then they, they also talked about um, some other technologies. Um, this was Haptex. Uh, they weren't really showing anything particularly new other than the fact that their, their, um, their system is now can be mounted to a backpack, kind of. Um, it still has, as you can see, there's a bit of a box um, that still has to send a lot of the fluids into the backpack. Um, but their haptic system is really interesting. Um, and, you know, they've, they've built some really interesting technology 
And it's more of a VR technology, but I could see it being applied in AR as well, um, just because haptics are really valuable in making immersion feel real. Um, and then this was a demo that I got at the show um, from Looking Glass Company, and they were showing their super high resolution displays. Um, these are 3D displays, but they were working with um, ultra haptics um, or ultra leap, sorry, ultra leap to do hand tracking and combine hand tracking with the 3D display to kind of give you an idea of how you could create kind of an immersive um, experience without a headset. Um, and then um, AR House was demoing, but um, there were other companies there as well, XCOM Labs. This is actually with a Microsoft HoloLens. They were demonstrating a, their, their system where they're able to stream from a local system, uh, you, basically using like a very high performance server, streaming wirelessly over 60 gigahertz to the, the, top, to the top of the headset. That way the headset's doing remote rendering basically. Um, this is the VR version of it, but you can kind of see what that puck looks like that they're using for 60 gigahertz. Um, but they're doing both AR and VR. They showed two different experiences. And during that, they also announced that they're going to be doing a location-based exclusive relationship with the void and investing in the void, uh, taking 10% of the company as well. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, there were lots of other holographic displays. Um, Leia uh, was there showing off their 15.6 inch displays as well as Sony. Um, both companies were kind of showing 3D content using um, you know, volumetric video capture as, as an application, but also using um, some other content, 3D movies and things like that. And then um, I also got a chance to finally try the Realware Navigator 500, um, which they announced at CES. Um, this is much more of an industrial application uh, but it is really interesting because all the applications they're showing off are like real actual customer deployments. Uh, and right after the show, they actually announced that uh, 3,000 Ford dealers will be rolling out with their last gen headset, not this current gen. Uh, I'm using that to kind of help technicians repair vehicles and, and you know, reduce downtime. Uh, and then other stuff, you know, Open BCI uh, was at the show uh, with Vario. And they announced their $22,000 uh, Galea headset, which is for, you know, brain interface uh, communications. Uh, and then you know, Snap announced their $140,000 Lensathon. And then AWE as an organization also announced their own $100,000 XR climate change prize. Um, so there's a lot of things that were happening at the show, lots of different partnerships. Um, Pimax announced their Crystal VR headset. Um, and then we have... Uh, Dispolix announced a couple partnerships um, with micro LED manufacturer JBD and another one with laser beam scanner projector manufacturer Trilight. And then Microsoft kind of teased MRTK 3.0 and a ton of open XR momentum, including um, the uh, newer company, um, what's their face? Uh, XCOM Labs is also using open XR for what they're doing. So lots of stuff happened. I'm trying to kind of fire it off real quick, but I think. I kind of got it under the wire, but I think the big takeaways were that Magic Leap is really um, gaining a lot more momentum in terms of what they have with their new new hardware and, and platform. And, you know, OpenXR is gaining momentum as well as, a, as an industry standard. And that's, that's kind of my spiel. Thank you, Angel. Uh, question from Deb, is there a great presentation? Is there anything you disliked? Um, I, I'm censoring the question, or I mean, uh, I guess I'll just say, so Deb wants to know, is there anything you hated or disliked at AWE? Um, did you hate anything or? Uh, Honestly, I, I didn't really, I don't think I would say I really hated anything. AWE is a pretty good show. I would say some companies didn't really show anything particularly new. Um, so I kind of um, didn't give those companies much attention. Um, but I think the, the thing that I saw, um, that I didn't like was just companies kind of coasting um, with whatever they had um, and just showing up at the show to be there rather than you know trying to have something. Um, but in general, I think the show was very good and I think most people who attended were very happy to be there. Awesome. A question from, uh, from Josh. When you mentioned open XR, do you include web XR in that category as well? Um, not necessarily, just because open XR, I'm, I'm specifically talking about the Chrono standard. Um, but I think that um, 
everybody that I've seen deploying OpenXR generally accepts that WebXR is necessary to support OpenXR um, because it's it's essentially the web browser um, standard for communicating cross-platform. So I, they're not necessarily you know connected directly, but I would say that they 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 come very much hand in hand. Awesome. And uh, one more question. Uh, based on what you've seen, what are some of the, the largest themes that you feel the industry is heading towards? That's a good question. So um, right now, I actually think that there's a site correction on the AR space. I think there was too much hype um, around AR because everybody thought Apple was going to go AR first. And I'm starting to see more people starting to, starting to slightly correct a little bit more and think, okay, maybe pass through AR is really what we should be targeting um, because see-through optics still have a long way to go. Um, there were some really compelling AR display technologies that I did see at the show, um, especially from companies like um, um, Dispolix and um, View, Vuzix and a bunch of other companies. But um, I would say that see-through AR optics are still gonna have a challenge. I think Magic Leap has actually made me feel like they might be more towards the leading edge in terms of what's capable today, as opposed to the future. Um, so I think they really are, are actually more on the leading edge than they appeared to be previous to Magic Leap 2. Um, but in general, I think there's gonna be a little bit more of a correction towards VR headsets doing pass through AR rather than trying to ship a complete waveguide based system. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Anshul. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, continuing on, um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, who's here in the audience, one of the uh, coolest AR developers out there, um, developer of Epic Marble Run, my favorite game. Shucks, thank you. Tell thank you for man. being here. <laughs> it's an honor to have you. Um, so moving on, we are, I'm excited to introduce tonight's speakers who are working towards pushing the industry forward and making what was once impossible reality. Uh, first up, Ed Morris is joining us. He is VP of Strategic Partnerships uh, at a really awesome uh, company, Zapper. Um, and he's the VP of Strategic Partnerships in North America. Um, he's been in the XR space for the past seven years, which is awesome. Um, Zapper is a, for those who don't know, they're a leading AR platform, creative studio, and headset manufacturer combined and an early player in the mobile AR space. They worked across sectors with clients, including Nestle, Unilever, Puma, H&M, AB InBev, 7-Eleven, and Universal. Previously, Ed co-founded a London and New York City-based XR production studio. Ed lives in Brooklyn, New York with his wife and two kids. Thank you, Ed, for joining us. Hey everyone, and thanks Andy for having me. It's 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 great to be here. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen one second. All right, cool. We're in business. Cool. Um, so yeah, today just wanted to really give um, a high level of what we've been up to recently. Um, the team have been really really busy on a on a ton of product innovations across the business. Uh, so I really just want to touch on those and then I'm um, obviously happy to answer any questions. So I guess Andy stole my first line, but um, this is really Zapper in a nutshell. So the three pillars to the business are Creative Studio, Zapworks, our, our AR toolkit, and, and then Zapbox, which is we kind of soft launched it at AWE, but really, really excited about, about the opportunities here. And really the package of all these three pillars is it, it all goes together for our mission to democratize AR and, and to really make it as accessible as possible to as many people. So we've, we've been around for 11 years. Um, in general, corporate America, not a long time, but uh, in the space we're all in, quite a, a fair while. Um, team of 75 of us. Um, and over that time, we've, we've produced over a thousand projects, um, as Andy mentioned, pretty much across every vertical. There's, there's not many briefs that come in now that we, we, we don't have at least something to show. Um, again, just a, just a slide to show sort of everything from 7-Eleven to GSK, Motorola, Rovio, Stanley Black & Decker, TD Bank. 
really, really is um, uh, across the whole whole spectrum of of, of sectors. So fresh out of AWE, we were we were really really excited to um, to win two awards for our for our platform side of the business. So we we won an orgy for best creator and authoring tool, and then also best developer tool. Um, really, what we've done with Zapworks is we have <laughs> thanks, Sandy. We've we got a bunch of different tools, everything from Zapworks Designer, which is our very simple no code browser based drag and drop solution um really kind of lightweight entry level a lot of people do interactive business cards with this uh we've just rebuilt this from the ground up given it um some nice 3d capabilities as well which it didn't have before um so really really excited and, and seeing some good uptake with this uh, mo moving across we have zapbox studio um our proprietary authoring tool downloadable piece of software, um, JavaScript based, we expose TypeScript though. Um, it's, it's really what we use in, as an internal studio to build most of our experiences. And then what we've done with Universal AR is, is, is the team said, look, there's some great devs out there who may not be familiar with JavaScript, but they're amazing at um, through JS or Unity or shout out to Josh, Babylon JS, which is a new one. Um, so, so again, just really that opportunity to, with, through a bunch of SDKs, stick on our, uh, as we like to call them, Zapper superpowers onto these um, existing workflows. So we support a full range of tracking types, a um, bunch of different um, code tracking, everything from from custom zap codes, which is the, the lightning bolt that you see here, um, which we do for a lot of our app-based stuff. Um, our technology is embedded in, in a bunch of apps, not just kind of custom things. Obviously QR code scanning as well for our web-based work. And then we've got image tracking, world tracking, face tracking. Um, again, image tracking, posters, sides of vans, billboards, direct mailers. World tracking, understand the world around you. We do a lot with Rovio and Angry Birds. Uh, place an Angry Birds game on your table and, um, and, and, and sort of enjoy that. And then face tracking, which I don't think needs much introduction anymore, thanks to uh, the likes of Snap and, and others. And then curved surface tracking. We've made some updates to this technology recently. We're really excited about what this can offer. Um, obviously, a lot of our work in the alco bev space is is really interested in this as well so so this is a this is a nice development i mentioned this before but um we started out 11 years ago with the zapper app not really use that much anymore typically what we do on the apps app side of the business now is where our sdk is embedded into existing client apps um big one for us has been a, an amazing partnership over a number of years now is with uh 7 11. So we power all of the visual discovery through the Seven Rewards app, um, which, is, which is really great. We're getting about 15 million scans a year in store um, across different 7-Eleven locations. And um, I'm, I'm really seeing a, a wide range of um, brand partners that they've been able to activate through this umbrella relationship that we have. Um, also Shazam as well. So we powered visual discovery through Shazam um, until Apple bought them in 2018 and, and uh, ruined the party as, as they sometimes seem to do with uh, third party relationships. Um, and then, but, but unsurprisingly, most of what we're seeing at the moment is, is mobile web AR. Uh, what we found is that the, the gap between what can be produced in an, in an app and the web, obviously it's, it's not as 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 strong and, and high fidelity as some of the stuff we can do in the app, but it's the the, the gap is narrowed um, largely because of the 15 cameras that most of these devices have on them nowadays. Um, so yeah, the, we're seeing a, a ton in the in the web AR space. Um, pretty much everything we do in CPG, everything we do with sort of Disney, DreamWorks, um, and the like, and and the increasing work we're doing in retail as well. Um, very much kind of web AR is leading the way in that regard. Now, so onto the zap box. So as I, as I said, we, um, we soft launched it at AWE. Um, really, really excited about it. It, it, 
it, it's really grown up in this iteration. It started out um, in 2016, I believe, as a as a as a uh, similar to Google Cardboard cardboard form factor, and and, and we kind of got to the point where we were like, this is actually pretty good. It's not really a hobby anymore. We should turn it into a business unit. And and to be transparent, it was really the form factor factor that was letting it down. So what we've done with this iteration through a, a pretty crazy run of supply chain issues and finding out that Russia owns 90% of the neon production in the world and apparently we need neon for some of the components that we need for this. We've, uh, we've managed to, to get the first units off the, off the production run. We've seen the first 10, we brought the 10 to AWE. Um, had a few meetings there, which which was great to to show everyone and and get some initial feedback, and then um, the, the the first batch of five thousand, which is going to largely fulfill the Kickstarter backers initially, um, and our consumer launch around August uh, October. Um, so yeah, like I said, really really excited about this. Um, it's a uh, it's really come on it we we actually halfway through the process we decided to bring in um active controllers as well so um really really interesting in term, in terms of what can happen there we expect it to um retail around the 80 dollar mark and when you look at the feature set stacked up with a lot of what else is out there we think it it really it really fits nicely into that affordable market and, and, and particularly on the performance as well. Um, underlying it's gonna be um, Unity. So uh, Unity, Unity based. Uh, we, we really like the way that the peripheral vision has, has worked out. Um, it, it gives a really nice level of immersion, but also um, not kind of walking into walls and things like that, which obviously is, is, is good as well. Um, we've got video pass through um, PC VR and PC streaming is very interesting that the, the, the team are really going after. And, and we think there's a, a really, really nice opportunity there as well. Um, still working on, on building out the runtime and, and the launch um, content is going to be sort of what we call evergreen games, which, which we're going to do as a launch package. Um, I'm speaking with a really, really interesting retail partner who we think, fingers crossed, will will launch with us. Um, and otherwise, the majority of the conversations we're having are around sort of education, L and D, enterprise. Um, so, so excited to see how this kind of shakes out in the next few months. Uh, just some kind of pretty videos here: turtle flying through the air. Um, and yeah, on, on the horizon as well for, for Zapbox and, and indeed some of the other stuff we're doing is, is hand tracking. So here's really the, the, the man behind everything, Simon. Uh, Zappa began from his PhD at Cambridge University. Um, he's really, Zapbox is very much his baby and, and he's been doing some really incredible stuff with, with his team in terms of bringing this, bringing this to market. Um, the other thing I really wanted to mention was Zap Vision. Um, again, as as often happens with us, this this came out of um, a conversation with the client. They were really big into accessibility, and and really they asked us the question: um, Can your technology help with um, with accessibility for 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 the visually impaired? And instead of saying no, we said, "Let's we'll come back to you. Give us a couple of weeks." Um, and we jumped into it and, and really, again, this was, this was really down to the work we've been doing around what we call the D3 markers for the Zap box. Um, we've been able to, to put, you, you see here, sort of the, the, the backwards L around the QR code. So that's a QR code that scans as a normal QR code. Um, but, it, but it's also, so, so you could scan it as if you've got um, full, full vision, scan it as a QR code as you normally would, it's going to take you to the experience. But then from further distance, it's, um, it's also working for the visually impaired as well. So it's in the, a couple of demos we've built, there's a, a text to speech component. 
um, which obviously gives the key key features of the ingredients, um, what the product is, and, and things like that. Um, and then just kind of a bit of this is this is actually brand new. So a lot of what I'm talking about, I'm actually reading off the slides. If I'm being totally honest, so instead of me reading, I'll, I'll let you guys read it as well. Um, I haven't got a slide for this, but just a, a final thing that I wanted to mention was um, some work that we, we've worked with a company called Avatar um, to, to create an SDK, really. Um, they're called Avatar SDK. We, we've essentially created a product that we called MetaMe. And essentially, it takes a, a 2D selfie, runs it through their API, and turns that into a 2D head. Uh, so we've been having a lot of fun with with a number of different clients in in creating the different bodies, everything from sort of crazy Call of Duty figures to Hawaiian beach people to um, a, a really interesting one for a, a Beiersdorf Innovation Conference as well. Um, so again, a really really interesting um, product that we're we're having a lot of fun with and, and really excited with. I've uh, I've rattled through that pretty quickly, but um, any questions, happy to answer. And my emails on screen, sort of always uh, happy to to chat or brainstorm with anyone. Thank you so much, Ed. Yeah, feel free to reach out to Ed uh, via his email. If you want to post your LinkedIn as well, feel free, Ed. Um, question from uh, from Kark: uh, What is the accurate accuracy of your tracking when compared with other toolkits such as Euphoria? In terms of the Z in is that vision or just normal QR code scanning? Or oh, sorry, you mean the anchoring? Um, Kark, if you want to follow that one up, um, I think that was posted around the Zap Vision time. Around Zap Vision. Yeah. Um, I mean the 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 honest answer to that is that there aren't a huge amount of people that we're aware of doing this tracking for the visually impaired at, at distance. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but one of our big CPG clients was actually working with this other company to bring um, this accessibility, accessibility tool to, to market. There were some issues around the legal and, and that was why the question came to us and is can you guys sort this out? Um, so I don't actually have a, a, an answer that I can really quantify around that I'm afraid um if you if you want to follow up with me afterwards I'm happy to 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 take that to our platform team who can who can probably give us give you a better answer around that awesome thank you Ed. Uh, another question uh, uh with your seven years in the industry how have you have how have you seen it shift and and how is uh, Zapper uh potentially uh, evolving to adapt to those changes Wow, good question. Um, so, so yeah, I, I'd say um, maybe a, a bit of a flippant answer. First of all, I think there's definitely a lot more um, competition around the creative studio side of the business. Um, when I had my initial agency a, a number of years ago, um, there were a lot chunkier budgets around. <laughs> if I'm being honest, um, we a lot of competition a lot of great companies out on the on the studio side of things and 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 that's we're definitely seeing the more competition there um i mean look i think zapper is is constantly evolving this is just a snapshot of some of the things that we're doing i i think we i think potentially there's an existential threat around web ar and web gl um and we're really happy to to see that our business is, is as diversified as it is. And I think that's a, that's a big protection. Uh, like I said, most of what we're doing on the creative studio side of the business is web AR, but it's definitely not all of the business. I think that box is gonna really fill a pretty big hole in terms of, well, not a hole, but additional revenue for us, uh, which will obviously help diversify. We still do a lot of work on the app side of the business, as I said, particularly on the, the embed side of things um but but yeah i i think that's a that's a great question and it's and it's always front of mind to us to to make sure that we're we're varied 
Definitely. Zapbox seems really interesting. Is it um is it available on Kickstarter now or is it something that will uh, be out in the future? Yeah, so we're we're targeting consumer launch uh, the first of October. Cool. Um, with all of the supply chain issues, we we we're pretty sure we're good on that. Um, I believe there is a button still on the website. Um, I think it's if you just go to zappa.com or zap.works, they'll you'll be able to link over to the to the zap box page. I I think there's still an option to to register there um hopefully you can still get it for the original 40 dollars i'm not actually sure if that's been changed yet this is the 80 dollars is kind of where we're where we're thinking on the retail side um but again if if you if you can't find it send me an email i'll i can um chat to rich who leads our zapbox business and 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 see what see where we stand on that awesome thank you so much Ed. thank you for joining us absolutely thanks again andy and, yeah, and good to see you all See you soon. Okay. Um, cool. Thank you, Ed. Next up, we have Ethan Sadia with us, the CEO and founder of PhotoCatch, a 3D content creation platform uh, for any industry, and a two time Apple WWDC scholar, an entrepreneur and creative technologist. Ethan has led projects bridging software, hardware, and design and pioneering innovative technologies like augmented reality and machine learning. Ethan has nearly 10 years of experience as a developer and speaks about AR at developer conferences and meetups uh, around the world. So Ethan, it's a pleasure to have you here with us to learn about PhotoCatch and otherwise. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, uh, my name is Ethan Sanya, and I'm the founder and CEO at PhotoCatch. And I'm excited to talk to all of you about how with PhotoCatch, you can build more immersive AR experiences in just a few minutes. And here's a little more about me. Uh, I am the founder of PhotoCatch. And before that, I've had six years of experience as an iOS developer. And I've been working with augmented reality ever since Apple announced AR kit in 2017. And since then, I've submitted uh, uh, two of my projects uh, in AR that have won Apple WWDC scholarships, both in 2019 and 2020. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, previous AR experience and how my experience building uh, these apps have shaped my mission uh, for building PhotoCatch. So here are four select projects that I've decided to talk about. And the first one is an augmented reality uh, school campus tour that I developed uh, for a high school. And uh, it lets you, uh, it adds 3D content on top of the buildings uh, exactly uh, where they are in real life. So using location tracking merged with augmented reality. And I added uh, labels on all the buildings with some 3D stickers that indicate what each building is for, such as the test tube and microscope for the science building and uh, video camera for fine arts and some pizza and coffee for the cafeteria that's off screen. And these 3D models, um, I mostly downloaded from sites like the uh, Google Poly, which they've now shut down, and uh, websites like Sketchfab. And uh, since this was a very uh, low budget student project, uh, I was only able to find these very simple 3D models, but still uh, to create a pretty immersive and exciting experience for the first year of AR kit being available to developers. And another uh, app I built is called Pi AR. It's a 3D uh, circuit building tutorial uh, that shows you how to uh, build an LED blinking circuit step-by-step -step in AR. Inspired by uh, my experience working in the STEM education industry and uh, teaching teachers and students how to put together circuits and trying to solve their uh, confusion with taking 2D circuit diagrams and bringing them into the 3D components that were sitting in front of them. And these uh, uh, 3D models, uh, I made the Raspberry Pi myself uh, from scratch and found some very simple components uh, on Google Poly. But uh, unfortunately, 
uh, as the budget was low, uh, no very high detailed components uh, for the things like USB sticks and HDMI cables and SD cards. Uh, so, but it still was very effective in helping solve the problem of making a tutorial useful for beginners to circuits. Then uh, the first app that I submitted for the WWDC scholarship that I won uh, was this educational app, this time for younger children to teach them uh, all about the colors in AR. At the middle, you have an Animoji dog that prompts you to pick a color. And if you get the right one, the balloon will fly away. And then in 2020, I built an augmented reality Apple store so that you could browse all the latest Apple products in AR. Uh, from your home while all the Apple stores were closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And when I posted this one on Twitter, it was actually liked by Tim Cook, which was uh, a very proud moment. And all these uh, 3D models, except for the tables, which I made from scratch, uh, I was uh, able to get from the Apple website. And these are the highest quality 3D models that I had been able to source for these projects. So in all of my AR experience, the hardest part of building for AR, as I've talked about, has been creating or finding 3D assets. Uh, I've explored a couple of different ways uh, in the past for how to get these assets. You can either create them yourself in a program like Blender or Autodesk Maya, but I'm not a 3D artist, and that takes a lot of time to learn and to make each 3D model. And if you use a, a software like Blender, it's free, but time is money and it's, uh, you'll, you'll be spending days working on creating the assets, more time than actually building the, uh, the prog and programming the AR experience. You could also purchase 3D models online, uh, which saves you a lot of time, but you'll have to pay for each asset. And as you start making more complex apps and looking for higher quality assets, uh, the cost will start adding up. You could also hire a 3D artist, but that will still take a lot of time and it'll cost you a lot more money. So uh, that's the main uh, focus of PhotoCatch. PhotoCatch is a platform that lets you create 3D content in just a few minutes for a fraction of the cost. We're a platform uh, that works on almost any Apple device from Mac OS to your iPad to your iPhone. And PhotoCatch is powered by photogrammetry. So you can take a real world object take photos from any angle all around it, and then you can turn it into a stunning 3D model in just a few minutes. So this shoe, I took photos all the way around it from uh, all these different angles shown in the animation, and this is the output that you get after just a few minutes in PhotoCatch. And we offer three easy ways to create 3D models in the app. There's the classic photogrammetry approach of using individual photos and that gives you the most control over the quality and detail and angles that you use to create your 3D model. But what we also did was uh, create an extremely easy way to create 3D models for beginners, and that's video import. So all you have to do is hit record and start walking around an object, and in 30 seconds, you can have a stunning 3D model. And late last year, we took video import even further and added multimedia. So you can combine multiple videos and add still images together to create even more detailed 3D captures and push the boundaries of what's possible with photogrammetry. So now to give you an idea of how PhotoCatch works, I'll do a quick one minute demo. Here's our PhotoCatch Mac app. And uh, it's an extremely easy and simple interface uh, that we've designed to be useful for both complete beginners and professionals who like to tweak lots of settings. So here is the video that I'll be using. It's a statue in downtown Austin. I started by walking around at a level angle and then slowly started moving the camera up to capture the top of the head. This is a uh, 2x sped up video so that I could show it quickly. The real video is about uh, 30 seconds. So I'll just drop it into photo catch. Here is our multimedia editor. Uh, if you want to tweak your settings, you can uh, adjust how many frames PhotoCatch will extract. You can uh, add more videos or photos if you'd like. 
But uh, our philosophy is that it can be uh, just as simple as clicking a button if you don't want customization. So you just hit done and PhotoCatch will extract the images and you can tweak some settings or just keep the defaults and hit create model. And that's it. Uh, you'll just wait a couple minutes for the 3D model to process. And uh, I already have the model here, so you don't have to wait to see it process. And after it's done, it opens in our uh, 3D editor uh, where you can view it from all angles, uh, do some cropping uh, transformations, uh, have control over all the texture maps and a lot more. You can export it to USDZ for native integration with almost any Apple AR platform, such as AR Quick Look or Reality Kit, or export to OVJ for compatibility with almost any other 3D software. And here is a 3D print that I made of this model. So the mesh is extremely detailed and you can use it for almost any application. So uh, that is the quick demo. It's just a small taste of what's possible with PhotoCatch. And I'll show a lot more of our features. Here uh, is the Raspberry Pi that I created uh, from scratch in the Pi AR example from earlier. And this took me about two days of manual modeling work in Autodesk Fusion 360, uh, because that's the only 3D program I knew how to use at the time uh, back in 2018. So this is the same Raspberry Pi uh, created in PhotoCatch. I took a 30 second video of a Raspberry Pi. It uh, processed in under a minute and a half. And the resulting 3D model is not only uh, created so much more quickly than doing it from scratch, it's also a lot more realistic. So it's uh, a lot more friendly for users who are trying to match this 3D object to the real Raspberry Pi sitting in front of them. And we're a lot more than just a 3D capture platform. We also let you uh, do desktop class 3D editing on any device. So you can access the same desktop features on Mac on both your iPad and iPhone. And this is extremely exciting because you can do everything from capturing your photos and videos, uh, uploading your uh, media to the cloud for processing and downloading the model and editing it, getting it ready for AR all on your iPhone. So uh, I'm from Austin and I like to go on walks uh, to see all the public art and murals that we have. And uh, while I'm walking, I can just take videos of objects, upload them and uh, edit them all while I'm on my walk without going home to my Mac. And uh, that's how I've created uh, all of these 3D models seen here. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, Apple featured PhotoCatch at WWDC. And uh, we showed several of these 3D models in that Apple included in one of their sessions. And these are uh, some of our favorite models. And uh, they're all relatively small objects that you could pick up except for this cow statue. Uh, and we really like uh, when customers think very big with PhotoCatch and that has led to some of our uh, favorite 3D models such as uh, this house. This is the oldest house in Houston and uh, it was captured with PhotoCatch video import uh, just with a phone taking a four minute video walking around the house a few times and uh, created this stunning 3D model we also have customers who are flying drones around castles to create 3D models and doing all sorts of other cool things with very large format models. And you can go even bigger than houses. You can capture entire uh, properties and construction sites. This uh, construction site was captured with multimedia import. So two videos, uh, one walking around uh, the entire property and the, uh, another video walking around the entire perimeter of the lot uh, to get the detail on all the cool art that was on the fence. And after about five minutes total of video, uh, it produced this extremely detailed 3D model that you can use for uh, VR environments or even put it in an AR experience as a very big background. And of course, uh, we have customers using PhotoCatch for all sorts of industries beyond AR and VR. These are just a few of the ones we see the most. 
And we have customers who are coming up with new use cases almost every day. And it's uh, always exciting for us when we see people use PhotoCatch for things. Uh, we never even uh, imagined that people could use it when we built it. So with PhotoCatch, the possibilities are endless and really the only limit is your imagination. And we're always looking for cool people and businesses to work with. So if you're working on exciting AR or 3D projects, uh, please contact us at business at photocatch.com and we'd love to hear from you. And uh, that's uh, my quick presentation and intro to PhotoCatch and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ethan. Awesome, pres uh, awesome presentation. Uh, thank you. Question from Aaron uh, Reyes. Uh, he said, what is the commercial model of your business? Uh, uh, well, we have uh, four very simple subscriptions and uh, two personal and two commercial. Uh, if you download the app, uh, you can find the uh, correct uh, plan that works for your business. And if there's uh, custom solutions you need or something you don't see in the app that you need, please contact us at business at photocatch.com and we can work on the uh, perfect solution for your 3D capture needs. Awesome, uh, a few more questions. Um, from iPhone, I saw, w, w, I saw WWDC as in third party presenter, did you work at Apple? Uh, I have not worked at Apple, uh, but I have been an uh, Apple developer for a long time and a very big fan of Apple. So I'm very uh, closely integrated uh, into the community, but uh, I have not worked there. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Jermaine wants to know, can you say a bit more about your work with museums? Uh, I can't talk about uh, specific clients uh, that haven't given us permission to share publicly, but uh, we have people uh, who are uh, from museums who are capturing all sorts of artifacts um, that they have on display in their museums and they want to bring to the entire world. So you don't have to go visit the museum uh, to explore things like um, dinosaur bones or uh, art pieces and other things like that. So you can see them in AR um, from your home without having to visit in person. So it's a very exciting application. Amazing. Okay, question from Kark. How different is it from the model created using the LiDAR sensor on iOS? Well, with photogrammetry, you can achieve much higher quality and uh, more precise results, especially on smaller objects. Uh, while LiDAR can be great for scanning uh, uh, very uh, large interior rooms pretty quickly. If you want photorealistic results, uh, then uh, photogrammetry is a much better approach. And uh, you don't need a, a LiDAR device. You can capture from any uh, device that has a camera. So that's any almost any iPhone or iPad. Wonderful. Okay. And one more question that I have. What are some of the the uh, what are some of the largest technical challenges you've had while developing PhotoCatch? See, uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's probably uh, getting our uh, all the full desktop capabilities to run on even uh, older iPhones. So we've done lots of optimization to make sure that uh, older devices can handle uh, even the largest three D models that you can create through our cloud platform. Awesome. One, one more question, sorry, uh, from Dan Miller uh, that just came in. I noticed the texturing was not very feature rich from the Pi example. Can you additively construct? Uh, I'm not, uh, if you want to contact me uh, through the business at photocache.com email, I can provide uh, more details once I learn more about what you're looking for, uh, since I'm not really sure from the question right now. Oh, the PCB pins. Uh, those are uh, very shiny. So uh, shiny objects are a little tricky to capture. So uh, I removed the PCB pins uh, for the capture. There. Well, thank you, Ethan, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Stephen, uh, welcome Stephen Black uh, to the uh, Zoom. Glad to have you. Um, okay. Next up, 
Um, we have uh, an awesome guy with us, Josh Elster, um, with, an, with a great bio, actually, uh, that I can't take credit for. Sorry, it's popping back and forth, but I'll, I'll do my best to read it. Um, so Josh Elster spends most of his days working as a software engineering lead for a technology startup and his nights patrolling the Babylon JS forums and working on various side projects. Unlike Bruce Wayne, however, he did not have a traumatic childhood incident involving bats. From his home in the windy city of Chicago, Josh likes to spend his time in the outdoors, particularly working with wood in his workshop when the weather indicates and gaming or reading when it doesn't. His website is at liquidelectron.com, which I'll post in the chat. It is very great to have you here with us, Josh. Thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate that. Thank uh, thanks for letting me uh, come and talk to your group here, by the way. Uh, after hearing everybody else speak, I got to say, uh, you know, I, I feel like definitely the odd man out in the group here because you know, everyone else has some really cool things to talk about here. And here, I've got a story to tell. So let me get that started here. And because, again, I don't have as much of, uh, you know, substance to talk about, I figure I'll go with just flash, you know, when, when in doubt, jazz hands. <laughs> So tech is a funny business to be in, as you all know. You never really know when something's going to come and upend your uh, progress there. Still, most progress in tech is evolutionary rather than revolutionary. But I suppose it's part of human nature that we tend to focus on the things that are more flashy and big changes rather than the small and incremental ones. Well, this is a tale of two timelines. But like any tale involving a multiverse, our shared universe diverges from the other at a very specific point in time. No, Steve Jobs doesn't survive in either timeline, but his legacy is something that our tale does involve in a non-trivial fashion. Let me uh, make sure I get the slide controls on here, right? Because they're slightly different than you might expect. So the year is 2017. Let me get my notes in line here too. It was obvious to everyone in the tech industry at the time that augmented reality is gonna be big. And it wasn't unexpected either. I mean, sci-fi authors, video games, uh, books, comics, pretty much everything in popular culture had been sort of predicating this wave of AR for quite some time then. It's more that the combination of hardware and software and available bandwidth, importantly, had never really quite been affordable to the consumer level. So up until that point, we'd had some very interesting uh, efforts into the space. I'm sure you all probably know a lot more about this than uh, the uh, superficial take that I'm uh, giving you here. But uh, you know, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, there's been everything from Google Glass to, well, some of the more successful things that we've seen today. But when I talk about augmented reality, just for one moment, make sure that we get our definition straight. I'm referring to the more um, evolved definition that is a colloquial one at the same time, where you have a more immersive mixed reality, as they may call it as well today. But this is 2017, though. So let's go back to there for now. Love it or hate it, Apple's App Store is a walled off garden that's extremely effective at giving Apple control over what developers can publish on their platform on their hardware. At the same time, smartphones were and remain an obvious platform for targeting AR applications. And it was also obvious to those people at the time, um, pretty much all of us included, I would think, that the best vendor agnostic way of putting the smartphone into that role would be through the web browser. Now, vendor agnostic is a little bit of a, uh, a hedge here because if we think about it, Chromium and Google, and therefore uh, Google kind of controls the market in that. Still, Apple controls 60% of the US smartphone market, which is a commanding share and allows it to dictate a lot of things uh, within its power. So in 2017, WebXR was uh, first established as, or the WebXR consortium group was founded. And the goal of it was to bring a web standard to browser APIs and vendors that would allow developers then to build applications on top of that to target AR and VR application. Uh, that's the opposite side of the spectrum uh, from Apple's nature here. So the App Store being walled off on one side and WebXR being open on the other, those are somewhat contradictory interests. So uh, if you think about it, Apple's joining and being one of the founding members of the WebXR 
group seems a bit contradictory. Uh, but if you're cynical, I suppose it would be perhaps in their best interest to be a part of that group. So Apple and its WebKit engine joined the WebXR consortium as one of its founding members, along with Google, Microsoft, uh, then Facebook, uh, I'm sure Samsung and uh, many other vendors as well. So the goal there again was providing the WebXR standard so that developers could have a consistent API across browsers and across hardware devices. So at the same time that Apple was, uh, excuse me, at the same time WebXR was launching, Apple was launching its AR kit. It's a proprietary closed source AR kit. And it also provides developers a cutting edge powerful APIs for developing AR applications, but it has to be on Apple's hardware, of course. So if Apple had been truly dedicated to implementing the WebXR standard, then WebKit today would have more than just the do nothing feature toggles and in our sibling reality, remember, this is a tale of two realities. That is exactly what happened. Exa Apple worked to release an AR kit to WebXR interface. In this other reality, AR applications have been flourishing in this intervening time to the point where it's kind of table stakes for any online retailer that wants to offer a shopping experience of physical goods. They have to have an AR experience along with that. Customers are happy to browse and shop and ultimately purchase from multiple different outlets without having to download, install, and set up multiple different AR smartphone apps. All they need to launch is a URL. So museums, artistic installations, and even memorials are able to provide high quality AR experiences over the web without busting their budget and with, that come within reach of almost everybody who has a smartphone capable of it. And then a graceful experience that degrades for those who don't. Theatrical performances and operas can provide live translations or in, uh, insights into what's going on for people who need the assistance or for those who just want a different view of the action. All of these things can be accomplished without necessarily busting already tight budgets. Although I can see how for some folks this might not actually be a good thing, but whatever else has gone on differently in our worlds, in that timeline, there's been much greater progress with augmented reality than in ours. So obviously things didn't turn out this way in our world. Apple's AR kit, instead of being used to build a bridge between the web and uh, Apple's hardware, was instead used to be a lever to keep developers and the apps and the users who use those apps on their system. It's completely understandable why Apple would wanna do this. It would be, it's also understandable why Apple might have, you know, not be upset if WebXR is slow walk. Their rival, really the only competitor in the smartphone market is Google and via the Chromium and uh, uh, the Android OS. And so if your view is zero sum of this sort of thing, then any gain for the web, which you know, Google de facto owns here in this scenario, is a loss for Apple. I should take a moment here to caveat my words a bit just for the sake of legal liability purposes and also to be fully honest. A lot of what I've been talking about is just pure speculation, uh, inferred conclusions based off of logical uh, 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 conclusions from existing facts. The alternate timeline, of course, is a uh, made up fantasy that's part aspirational and partly a logical anticipation of what we all hope to see in the future, I think. I can't, of course, speak to Apple's actual motives either, only attempt to outline what you can see from their actions, or rather lack of it regarding from uh, their support of WebXR on iOS. And most of the evidence for here comes from the publicly available WebKit uh, bug, bug tracker. So doing some digging in there and doing some research through there, uh, there are some really quick conclusions and because I know we're uh, gonna be short on time here, I wanna get a little bit to the point. Uh, the, uh, there's enough, unimplemented functionality in WebKit that we're not going to see uh, WebXR support in iOS anytime soon, not in 2022, potentially not even in 2023. If I had to take a speculation, and I'm not the analyst here, of course, I'd have to say that they're probably waiting to get their own hardware out, which they've, of course, been rumored to be talking about for such a long time. It's probably almost as old as the iPhone itself, those rumors. But uh, the latest rumors have them putting out uh, I think a headset somewhere around 2023 for consumers. So we'll see what happens with that. And unfortunately, that's a big bummer though, because you know I would like to see this 
more uh, evolved version of uh, WebXR and AR over the web. And I think we all would like to see that. So uh, I think, I hope Andy, that you're not uh, regretting inviting me to speak here, uh, but I, please hold, hear me out though. You just give me, give me a moment, give me a moment. I've got, more to, I've got more to talk about. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. So every journey has its dark hours and has its uh, light ones as well. This story and this tale of two timelines, it doesn't end here at this event or tonight. It doesn't even, uh, it's not even the middle of the story. This is just the beginning of the story because the darkness has to have somewhere to go before you know, the sun can chase it out. Something like that, you know, you'd read on an inspirational poster. Just hang in there, kitty. There are some amazing tools and frameworks that are being worked on by a lot of different people across the community to make 3D a first-class citizen of the web, no matter what experience you're shooting for. Babylon JS, which we'll look a little bit more in a moment here, and Babylon Native, including the Babylon React Native project, uh, they provide a rock solid foundation to uh, let you code against these rapidly evolving standards and APIs and still be confident that your code will be backwards compatible when it changes and allow you to also target multiple platforms, including iOS. Although, of course, you'll still have to uh, uh, publish your app to the App Store and uh, deal with their uh, restrictions. So that is my story that I have to tell. So I, I've always to been told that you have to show and tell. So after showing now, or wait, after telling, now I'd like to show you a little bit more about my book and talk to you a little bit more about my book. My book, Going the Distance with Babylon JS, isn't centered necessarily around how to build an AR application, but its focus is on giving readers the knowledge and the learning tools on how to build any type of 3D application on the web. So that can include, of course, VR and AR experiences. Space Truckers is the game that you'll learn how to build throughout the process of reading the book, but it's also a standalone open source project. It has a reference repository that serves as a guide for people looking to learn, how do I build something and actually use it in an application? So past, a little bit past the documentation where you read just about one topic and about one thing, and expanding that to bridge that gap to see how you can use it as part of an actual application. So with that in mind, why don't I uh, stop my cool view here and we're gonna see now the actual game. Uh, let's see. Big money on showing the right screen on the first try. All right, Space Trucker is the video game. And I'm gonna get myself into trouble by launching it on a 4K screen at full uh, size here while I'm sharing, but we'll see what happens anyway. So over the course of the game, and hopefully the, uh, let me know if the sound here is too loud. Uh, over the course of the, of the book, you learn how to build- We don't see any, uh, any graphics yet. I don't know if it's loaded. Sorry. Of course, nope, that, that's, how the, that's how it's gonna work, right? Uh, let's see, let me try just stopping and restarting the sharing here. How about now? Yeah, it looks good. All right, excellent. So we missed the splash screen. I think we'll live with that. And uh, let's just go straight into the gameplay here. So I'm gonna make this slightly bigger here so we can see the full main menu. And let's just see where we play. So in Space Truckers, it's kind of like a desert bus but hopefully less boring. The idea is that you are a space trucker and you need to get your cargo from point A to point B. But first, you have to figure out what your route is gonna be. So you have a solar system here that you're navigating around and our goal is to get to this uh, floating buckyball thing here uh, that is around the planet, that's our capture zone. Our cargo here is around this uh, smaller Mercury-ish type of planet and uh, you can control its trajectory up and down, left and right, front and center, and as well as it's the amount of force that you put on it. So the amount of force that you use at your launch is directly tied to that's how much gas you're going to be using, and uh, that'll affect your final score. So you, you, less is more, in other words. Let's launch here and see how badly I'm going to do this uh, just by judging it on eye here. So launching out here, since this is a simulation, we don't need to worry about actually destroying anything or losing cargo. And, um, you know, let's be honest here, it's not the best shot. We might need to take another one here, but if we let it travel through the asteroid belt, it could arrive still at its destination. Let's let it drift a bit. 
And uh, as you can see here, Babylon JS, if you're not familiar with it already, is a fully uh, JavaScript based framework. Uh, it's written in TypeScript, of course, so you can use uh, TypeScript, but it's uh, primarily JavaScript based. So we've reached our destination. We want to use this flight. Let's actually drive this route now. So the next phase is the driving phase here. Again, you'll have to excuse the um, primitive artwork. I didn't have a, a subscription to a uh, photo catcher at the time. So uh, you know, I'll have to correct that and start getting some better assets added to my game. So throughout the course of planning the route, you'll have different random encounters. And each of these spheres here is a uh, random encounter. There are different types of random encounters, although the spheres obviously wouldn't show you that because uh, this a lot of this game is still placeholder stuff. Again, the game is uh, not the point to uh, is to show uh, how to make pretty assets. It's more how to build the application itself. So uh, that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. So the idea is you guide your truck through and out these obstacles. I'm actually a little bit amazed that I was hardly paying attention there, and I managed not to collide with anything. And if you're lucky, you'll reach the end of it, where you can get your uh, final score and uh, uh, you're memorialized into the scoreboard if you're really lucky and get a high score. So that is Space Truckers, the video game. I'm going to uh, just stop that one here so that we have enough time to get to the actual book. Uh, going the Distance is available on uh, Amazon and it will be uh, released or made available for publication, hopefully within uh, by early August, I'm hoping, or uh, early to mid August, although the current date of October 11th is what you'll see there. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, supply chain issues and printing issues don't really delay it that much, but we'll see what happens. Uh, thanks again for having me here, folks, and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Josh, for joining. Uh, question from iPhone. Um, I'm not exactly sure what, what, feel free to clarify iPhone if I don't ask this properly, but he says, so what's significant about this game again, that it was written in a future proof language, what will interface with whatever product Apple will ship? Does that? It does make sense. Yeah. Okay. So it's a sort of a multi-part question. The first part of it is that uh, Babylon JS, one of their rock, one of the core commitments of the entire project is backwards compatibility. You can take a code that was written in Babylon 2.0 and run it on Babylon JS 5.0, largely unchanged. Uh, and that's, you know, the time period of like five, six, seven years, something like that. Uh, Babylon uses WebGL and all those APIs, and it's essentially a wrapper over that, very similar to how 3JS does that. So uh, in terms of the future proofing language on there, that's sort of, I'm hoping I'm addressing that part of your question. In terms of interfacing with whatever product Apple will ship, uh, the game itself is not a demonstration of a cross-platform for uh, the Apple native hardware. However, the book we do cover in uh, one of the later chapters, uh, there's a brief section on how to use Nat Babylon Native with um, React Native or other type of uh, uh, native platform hardware capabilities for uh, code reuse purposes. So you could write something that runs in WebXR and Android, and also have a na native project that uses uh, that runs on um, iOS. I hope that answered your question. Yes. I think so. I can't speak for iPhone, but it's sounded good to me. <laughs> um, how did you get involved in Babylon JS, and why did you choose that framework versus 3JS or the other libraries available? That's a good question. So my first project on Babylon JS was uh, I want to say I first started using about four years ago. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers an old game called uh, Gravity Well. It was, I think, 95, something like that. It's an old shareware game. And I remember playing it as a kid and I just really enjoyed it. And I just was thinking to myself, man, it'd be really fun to just recreate this game. And I'd really like, and I've been wanting to learn a, uh, you know, a web GL type of uh, language and searching around, I saw, I found 3JS and Babylon JS. And uh, I don't know why I picked Babylon over three, to be perfectly honest. It was uh, one of those things where I think, uh, I think I just went to the site and uh, I just haven't looked back <laughs> in a sense. So that was my first project was a, a game Gravity Well and that actually evolved and you can find that at um, gravwell.liquidelectron.com or actually better yet, probably just go on my GitHub and uh, find the link from there. And that uh, is a, puts you on in, uh, in the view of a ship riding a, um, 
a uh, alternate universe sort of thing where uh, gravity is the y dimension so modeling out gravitational forces and uh, like in terms of like full end body mechanics oh there we go <laughs> that's it, right okay. yeah 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 um i'll play it later yeah yeah it takes a bit to crunch up because uh it's all running it's doing some stu really stupid stuff client side i mean there was a great way to learn babylon js uh and it's one of those things where i look at it now and i go man i'm probably gonna have to take another swing at this for at some point oh, that's cool oh, there it is awesome. yeah here we go here we go so uh hitting resume there will uh will show you the gravity field there visualized uh for this sample system that's shown wow. on the map and then you can fly cool. your ship around it beautiful awesome and as far as i can tell it does it follows physics uh except for any floating point errors that i've made on my own awesome thank you josh yeah thank you Great awesome question. presentation thank you so much thank you um okay so we have some extra time here if, if anyone has any questions feel free to post them in the chat for any of the speakers and uh, uh, happy to open them up to the group. Um, or if you have something you'd like to present, feel free to share. Um, Steven, do you have anything you'd like to share with the group while you're here? I know you're working on some cool stuff. Oh, you're on mute, sorry. You're on mute. Sorry. Hey, I just like to say that if we're going through the 25th and I hope we are, it's going to be pretty exciting. Um, yeah. We're going to have a physical space. Is that correct at Columbia? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I'm doing spatial AR, geopose based AR, and it's just going to be some really exciting stuff. I met Andy a year ago in September. And since then, stuff from all over the world, from Venice, from uh, other places in New York and just showing concrete examples of what geopose AR can be, which uh, that's a whole topic unto itself. And I'm just really excited about the 25th. Yeah, your work was great. Thank you so much, Stephen. I look forward. Awesome, cool. So uh, if there's no more questions on the chat, um, thanks Josh for posting your links. Speakers, if you'd like to post your LinkedIn's and emails, um, feel free to do that here. Um, I think it could be great. Thank you, Aaron uh, Reyes. Um, thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Ed, for joining. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Anshul. Thank you, Josh. Uh, really great having you all. Awesome companies. Awesome thank you. Companies. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thanks awesome. a lot. Yeah. Great meeting you all. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Andy. Good to see you, everyone. You too. See ya. Have a good one. So Josh, is your uh, is your your books available for uh, for, for pre-ordering? That's correct. Yep, the Amazon link is posted there. I I used the URL shortener there because uh, it didn't quite fit on the slide there. But uh, if you want a clean link, I can happy to post that as well. Yeah, please. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Ethan, so hopefully, a, yeah, they got it. Cool. Hopefully, some folks reach out to you, Ethan. That'll be great. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm sure, Ethan. When you were describing your uh, your experience with putting together that 3D content, I was just like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm right there with you. You're gonna see that, yeah. And you, you kind of saw that too. It was, I one of the things that I would recommend is if you ever uh, get asked to write a technical book, make sure you um, build whatever technical thing it is you're gonna do before you start writing. That's, that's a key. That's a key. Yeah, and that uh, sounds like good advice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're not always able to do that, uh, but uh, yeah, I found that uh, it it really significantly impeded progress a lot, having to build and then iterate and then writing about it, and then oh wait, two chapters later, you realize I've got to change you know this pattern that I'm using here to you know, because it just doesn't work at scale. So then, well, then you go, got to go back and do some revisions there. And uh, it's, it's not that efficient. So you, you were creating the game while writing the book. Is that what I understand? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in this case, it's sort of self-inflicted, but also it's kind of to the point of it too, because part of what I wanted to do is try and show how uh, regular developers can get involved with doing these three type of 3D application creation. 
And so part of that involves, you know, knowing, hey, we're going to start at one place and it's not going to be where we necessarily want to be at point D or E, but it'll be enough to get us to point D. And then from there, we'll know how to get to point C. So the kind of the discovery process of learning how to learn is hopefully what people will take away from the book as well. That's great. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, oh, Ethan, I got, um, I didn't up, update my Mac to the latest version. So we can do live debugging while we have time here. Um, and I can't even, I can't get it anymore. Oh. oh yes, it does require uh, Mac OS Monterey. Uh, but uh, if you do have a uh, iOS device with iOS 15 or later, uh, you can download it there as oh, well. I, I'll update my Mac as well. <laughs> I'm not like hung up on this version. I, I will. Have you um, ever uh, considered a cloud-based model for this stuff, Ethan? I mean, is there any reason it has to run on the client device other than privacy, security, and that? You know, oh, like yeah, that. we've we've had a cloud uh, a cloud service for over a year. Uh, so uh, that that's uh, like as uh, I mentioned uh, briefly in the presentation, uh, like everything you can do on macOS is now is has been available on iPhone and iPad. Um, so uh, you but can, not Windows though, right? I mean, when you said any system, you were referring to any uh, like Apple based system, right? Yes, uh, currently uh, only on Apple platforms, uh, yeah. but uh, it is cloud-based, so you can uh, do things like go on walks, find something cool to scan, uh, take a video and upload it, and by the time you get home, uh, you can have a whole library of 3D content from your uh, little adventure. That's great. Yeah, you got to play that up more. I, I, that, that, that was sort of like kind of, I, I lost that and I, I didn't catch that. That's, yeah, that's awesome. Question on that, Ethan. When you're going on your adventures, do you need to specifically have the uh, like the fact that you're scanning in mind, or do you just take photos and then later on Ooh. in the day you can browse your library and create models off that? See what I'm uh, saying? Yeah, with, I uh, like basically exclusively use uh, video import and multimedia. So I just uh, hit record. I if it's like a statue, I just walk around it, um, try to get it from as many angles as possible. Uh, sometimes that kind of reaching as high as I can to get the top of something. And now I, I bought a six foot pole that I can uh, attach my phone to at the end and uh, extend it as long as I need to, you know, reach something that's too tall or get the roofs of buildings and things like that. So uh, sometimes I just walk around with that uh, in anticipation of scanning things. Is it like a selfie stick? Sorry, Josh. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that. Um, it's it's like it's called a monopod, so a tripod, but just one uh, leg. So uh, you can attach a tripod holder mount that's designed for an iPhone, and uh, that's how you attach it. It's like an iPod. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. If you uh, if you use higher frame rates, if you go with like a sixty FPS, do you need to take less footage, or is it more just covering the? I mean, it, does adjusting that have any impact on, how, or how does that impact the the resulting capture? Yeah, the frame. What the frame rate will do is uh, just two things. So it's a balance or a trade off. So lower frame rates, like twenty four FPS, will let in uh, more light for. Um, like brighter, uh, higher quality frames, but effectively a slower also, shutter speed, right? Uh, yes, and it will introduce motion blur though. So if you're moving pretty quickly, uh, you will want to use a higher frame rate. Uh, but now, uh, what I I have a gimbal uh, that I put my iPhone in that keeps everything stable, so you can get great footage on 24 fps. Nice, nice. Yeah, and that way you're maximizing your your bandwidth too, because you're not you know storing all these frames that are never going to be used, right? Right. Yeah. So it's great for uh, storage space and fast upload speeds and all that. But now with five uh, G, uh, like ultra wideband, the upload speeds have been uh, very much improved, at least where I am. Uh, so you can upload four uh, K sixty FPS videos uh, very quickly. Yeah. 
Uh, what do you think of the um, that new uh, room scanning feature that uh, was released recently? Uh, well, we introduced a the first beta for that a couple hours after the keynote. Uh, that uh, if you look on our social media, we've posted links uh, to where you can try it if you have a lidar device with iOS 16. Uh, and uh, we're very excited about it and working on some cool uh, features for it internally. And uh, we will have more to share uh, soon. Was that a, did you guys do a test flight thing for it? Was that yes. you? Was it this one? Hold on, uh, let me see. Um, how do I find this? Was this your app? Uh, I don't think so. Well, I just saw it yesterday. I don't know. I don't seem to. How do I? I would love to try your app out. That sounds amazing. Um, uh, let me, I'll see if I can post the link in the chat. Yeah. Cool. You ever play with an app called uh, iCircuit 3D? No. Is it good? Um, yeah, no, it, it's cool. It's uh, the guy Frank A. Kruger, I think, is the guy's name. And uh, it basically, you know, you know that Raspberry Pi that you had, he built something like that, but it actually simulates the electronics. Oh, wow. It's got like a, yeah, of like you've got hundreds of different electronic components there. So, you know, everything from just simple resistors and bells and all that stuff to like a full blown like Ada fruits and pies and pretty much everything in between. Yeah. Wow, that's a cool app. You think you should see that? Look at that. That's a cool app. And awesome. I got your link. I'm going to download that's That's amazing. So, this is your photo catch on iOS 16 already inst integrates this room scanner? Yes, um, we uh, launched it uh, like the same day of the keynote, uh, just wow. a couple of hours later. Uh, so uh, very quick to bring that to market oh, yeah. so yeah, our yeah. customers could start uh, playing around with it. So cool, really so cool. Well, great job. Great job, Josh. I'm excited for your book to uh, to be released. I'm sure it will uh, be me great. too. I can't wait for it to be done. I've <laughs> been working on it for almost two uh, two years now. One What's year. What's the process system. now? Like in the in these closing closing stages, like who do you have to work with in order to finalize the book? And yeah. So uh, I'm doing mostly tech reviews. I've got like a you know an in, you know the final introduction. Actually, the initial introduction is ironically the last thing that I end up writing because you know after everything else is sort of said and done. And right now I'm just, uh, the Babylon JS team is working with me to uh, do the technical reviews on the chapters, make sure I'm not talking too much out of my butt. And uh, you get a little bit, <laughs> uh, but also to make sure that I'm keeping up with uh, the feature set and such. Uh, you know, the, the recent release of the V5 of uh, Babylon was, you know, a very large one. And uh, there's, you know, there, it's a constantly evolving product. There's a lot happening with it. So. You know, by the time I, you know, got to this point on here, there were several things that were already sort of not deprecated, but not as up to date as they could have been. So, you know, doing that is a little bit of what's going on at the moment. Awesome. I can't yeah. wait to check it out. Yeah. Uh, definitely let us know when you have it uh, available. Yeah, I plan on posting actually a sample chapter uh, or two up at some point on there. I need to uh, clear it through my publisher and figure, you know, all that fun stuff and make sure that they don't get too mad at me for that. Um, but uh, I'll definitely make sure and send that link around when that's available. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for joining New York Augmented Reality tonight. Um, it was great having you. Um, Stephen would love to, to get a chance to chat about next month as well um, when you get a chance. But uh, um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll call it a, a night. Thank you everyone for joining uh, New York Augmented Reality. It was a pleasure to have you all. I'll be posting the link on YouTube for, for you all to review. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Ethan. Uh, thank you, uh, Ed and Anshul for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks again. I will thank, see you. You thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Steven, if you want to hop on, I'll put us in like a breakout room or something. I don't know how that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Hmm. You know, 
Uh, let me just send you a Zoom link. We'll just hop on another link. Hold on. Okay. Does okay. that work? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Hold yeah. on to Steven. Yeah, just take that. So I will leave this right now. Actually, don't leave that. Uh, I'll just go on your email. I'll email you a new link. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye-bye. Have a good night.